welcome to the Riley Retreat. Today we're going to be making sourdough bread. I've been looking forward to making this video for a really long time. One of the purposes of this video is to explain as much as I can in the most beginner friendly way. I found that I read a book, I went through multiple YouTube courses, and there's all this different information out there and I had to synthesize it and it took me about a, two years until I was making the loaves that I was really thrilled with. And so what I want to do is uh, be a shortcut for you and tell you as much as I can so that you can make the best loaf you can. When I first started making sourdough loaves, there was flour everywhere. Now it comes down to a bowl. And if I'm really meticulous, I can keep it pretty clean as I go because once that flour dries, that's when it gets really a lot harder to clean up. So um, if you do find yourself in that situation where your bowl has some dried flour, you just wanna let it soak in some water and let it soak overnight and the next day come back. And you can scrape it out fairly easily. I'm actually gonna show you two methods for making loaves. So these are the two tried and true, consistent, great rise methods that I have for sourdough. And its most basic form is water, flour, salt, and the starter. First, you need to know that sourdough is not an instant yeast type of bread. It generally takes two to three days. So today we'll make the starter, we'll let it rest, and then tomorrow we'll come back, we'll fold and mix all the bread, and then the next day we'll put it in the oven. I will put a link to the starter that we purchased. I highly recommend purchasing one so you can just get in the game, get your hands wet, and start making some really delicious bread. So when you purchase your starter, it'll probably come in a little package. What you wanna do right away is feed it. To feed it, you're gonna need flour and water and a scale. When I first started making starter or keeping my starter alive, I thought that I had to feed this puppy constantly. However, you don't have to feed it right after you make bread. This is all the starter that you need to maintain. So you could even potentially scoop all that out, cook with it and be like, oh no, I have no more starter left. Wrong, all you need is that because this has the wild yeast that's in the air and it's really strong and it just needs more flour and water. So uh, I'll take about 50 to 100 grams for a loaf and then put this in the fridge and that's it. Next time I'm ready to make bread, I'll pull this out, feed it, go to sleep, wake up and have a nice fresh active starter. And that is one of the most important keys of this journey is to make sure you have a strong starter. So if you're feeding your starter once, two, three times a week, that's when you're gonna get really great rise out of your bread. And it took me a minute to figure that out. But whenever I started to make bread regularly, my loaves just sprung up. So first, what you wanna do is turn on the scale, wait till it goes to zero, set your units to grams, place your starter on top. We'll zero it out. And what we're gonna do is add 50 grams of flour and 50 grams of water. Oh. I have my spoon in there so that zero wasn't accurate. All right, here we go. So, you want to be um, precise within, you know, give or take a gram or two. This and the water is what we need to be most precise on. So, 52 grams. Great. Here we're going to add water until we reach 52 grams as well. So, go slow with the water because, look how fast that went, oh, yeah. So this is fine, I have 53 grams of water, 52 grams of flour, good enough. Give this a stir. Clean off your spoon. And then you're gonna let that goodness sit out overnight until it's nice and bubbly. Yes, indeed. 
So we have hydrated our sourdough starter with equal parts flour and water. And that is all we have to do for this part of the journey. And what we're gonna do now is let this sit out um, about eight hours, eight to 12 hours. I like to let this sit out overnight bread nowadays it's not fermented it's not nearly as healthy so what happened is uh, during the world war um, we had to send troops with bread that wouldn't spoil in order to do that we had to strip all the nutrients out of our flour by bleaching it literally look on a lot of flour and you'll see chlorine is one of the ingredients so we strip it out and then, well, that's not really nutrient dense. So we add some more vitamins to it and that's called enriched flour. Nowadays, we don't have to do that. We're not in a war. We don't need that shelf life. Wonder Bread is not healthy for you. Don't eat it. Eat this instead. It's so much better. So normal bread, the phytic acid is blocking the absorption of vitamin B. And whenever we use this fermented dough, we're actually getting more of that vitamin B. Here you can see the very bubbly yumminess. You can see how yesterday it was thick and tough to stir. Probably couldn't have done this. Today, nice bubbly goodness ready to roll. This is what you want your starter to look like. All right, so now we're going to uh, start the dough. So we're gonna turn on our scale, place our bowl on it, and then zero it out. So you're going to see recipes that call for 50 grams of starter, 75, 80, 150. What you really want to understand is why and what the purpose is there. I like to stick anywhere between 50 to 75. The amount of starter you use is not going to affect your rise, but rather it's going to affect how quickly your food source, your flour is being eaten. Okay, so we've got our starter now. Now here is where I like to be the most precise. You hear a lot about hydration. This bread is, uh, in the 75% hydration area. I find that that's a nice workable dough. It's not too sticky, not too dry, great rise. So um, that's gonna bring us to 335 grams of water. Okay, so I got to 350. What I'm gonna do is take a little bit of that water out. And there we go, 335. All right. Now we throw in our salt. Now salt is anywhere between 12 to 15 grams or 10. It depends on taste. At this point, I've got it by feel, so I don't even need to measure 11 grams. There we go. Um, and then we're adding our rosemary. For some reason, I couldn't find anyone that talked about how much rosemary to add. So through experimentation, um, I figured out it's about 15, 17 grams. Uh, this is dried rosemary, didn't know you could use that. If you want, you could hydrate it, put it in water for about 10 minutes. I haven't noticed much of a difference, so I just throw it in. So right now I've got my flour, my water, my salt, I'm sorry, not flour, but starter, and rosemary. So I'm going to just give that a nice stir. Now it's important to do this before we add our flour. We're getting that starter spread throughout the mixture. So this is one of my favorite tools. It's called a dough whisk. And you'll see when we add the flour that it makes it really easy to get that stuff stirred up. You can use a spoon, um, but I find that that makes it a lot quicker. So zero out your scale. And now we're gonna go to 500 grams of flour. All right. So what we're gonna do now is just stir this up. And you can see, they call this uh, shaggy texture. So we're basically just trying to get as much of that water mixed into the dough as possible. Now we're gonna come to my next favorite tool. This is a dough scraper. Um, I like these plastic ones because when I'm working in these bowls, it really uh, contours to the edge. What I like to do is uh, get my hand 
in water and the scraper in water, and that allows it not to stick too much to the dough. What I'm gonna do is just go around the whole bowl and I'm doing this scoop to the center. And if I see it starts to stick, then um, just put a little bit more water on there. So this is, uh, this is just mixed. So it's gonna be a lot wetter. It's gonna be a lot stickier in this moment. If I let it sit a little bit longer, you're gonna see all these pieces start to come together. But uh, you can start working with it right away. And you can see I'm folding it in on itself. Now, the entire idea here, the purpose of this is to build gluten structure. So I like to work with this first because you can see it's really sticky. Next, I like to get my hand wet. Now, I don't want it dripping, soaking wet, so I shake it off a little bit. I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna do the same thing. So just grab a little edge, fold it into the middle. And you'll, you'll see whenever we do this again in an hour or two, the difference in the dough. So this first one, you can go around 30, 40 times, however much you want, 10, doesn't really matter. But what we wanna do is uh, bring it to the center. So and combined with that dough scraper in my hand, I think we've reached around 20 or 30 times. Now I like to pick the whole thing up and fold it in on itself. It's sort of a, a slap down motion. So I'm allowing it to fold over my hand and slam down. And again, we're just trying to build that gluten structure. Now you can see, compared to the dough that I just made, how formed that is. Okay, now that's just after one, one rotation here. So I'm gonna scrape the uh, edges of my bowl and just bring that in. And I'm gonna do that exact same process, those fold overs and then that slap and fold again in an hour or two. I'm gonna show you again right now real quick that same process. One thing you do want to avoid is breaking the dough. So I'll show you what I mean. Right now, you can see that as I hold this, it starts to fall, it's stretching. Eventually though, we're gonna get a break like that. We don't want that because it's like a rubber band. We've stretched too far that it's, it's broke. So you, you sort of lost that gluten structure in that, in that spot. So not the end of the world. All right, so we've got ourselves a nice ball here. Scraping our edges for easy cleanup down the road. There we go, voila. Throw your towel on top and we're gonna come back, repeat. We're gonna do this uh, two to three times as possible. All right, so welcome back. Uh, we are going to do our fourth and final set of folds. You can see that the dough is really expanded. There's some nice air pockets forming here. Has a great smell. So uh, nice and quick, we don't have to do a lot. You can see how just fluffy and expanded. I love the dough when it's in this state. It just feels, it feels so good. So much different from the start. You notice there's a lot more elasticity to it. You can uh, push down and it, it bounces right back. So, Really, you don't, you don't need to do a lot here. Um, this is just forming it into the ball before we put it into the banneton basket. I like to send a little bit of love to my dough at this time and just thank it for doing this thing. So what we're gonna do now is transfer this to the banneton bowls. In here is seasoned with rice flour. Sometimes you get little chunks of flour in here. So I like to just uh, get rid of those before adding new bread. Now we use rice flour at this point 
because there's no gluten in rice. And that prevents the sourdough from sticking to the panneton, which is really, really important. It's super frustrating to do all this hard work and then get it ruined by having it stick to the banneton bowl. It's just very disappointing. All right, so um, you use this little flour duster and I use this in the bowl. And then, then I take the scooper and I just push that rice flour underneath. And I'm doing this because I've worked so hard to get this dough into a nice aerated, airy, fluffy state. I don't want to ruin it when I'm transferring. So you can do it one of two ways. I found that it's fairly easy. You can just set the banneton bowl there and flip upside down. And now you have a nice transferred loaf. Um, you can also just plop it out. Either way works. All right. We are now going to put the caps on here. And this is just preventing it from getting dried out. Pop that up. And we're gonna pop that in the refrigerator overnight. Um, if you want and choose to in cold weather, you can leave it out overnight. I like to put it in the fridge for at least four hours if I do that. Sometimes my schedule doesn't work out get a last minute request for a loaf and um, we want to at least make sure we get four hours in the refrigerator. So you can see this is a super shaggy dough. I haven't touched it since I mixed it from the beginning. What I'm going to do is taste, take some water and just spray it on any surface. I like using this just easy cleanup and then Spray the dough a little bit and I'm going to just scoop it out. Now, you can see that it's just sat here, but it's still doing the same fermentation process. So, I get my hands wet and I like to take my ring off when I do this method. Just so it doesn't get in my ring. And I just spread it out. it. Now I just fold it in on itself and spraying this with water again prevents it from sticking. Uh, you can do whatever sort of fold you prefer. Get your hands wet, a slap and fold and we'll probably see a very similar rise. Um, so this is a great method if you have less time because I don't have another banneton bowl. What I'm going to do is just lay this towel in this bowl and I'll put rice flour directly on it. So just set that in there, put a little bit on top. All right, good morning, welcome back. Look at just took our sourdough out of the refrigerator and it's looking nice and expanded. We're going to take our Dutch oven. You can use any pot that's large enough to allow for the rise and expansion of the earth. Um, inside we have a piece of parchment paper. You can reuse it until it basically uh, falls apart, which is about three times, four times max. I'm just gonna take the parchment paper right over the turn it out. Now you don't need a brush but I like to take the brush and just dust off the flour. I'm not dusting it off so much, it's just spreading it evenly. And then, I like to make it down. Okay, so 
We have a lot of different cuts we can make. I'm no expert on these cuts. There's some really incredibly artistic designs out there. I will link to some of them in the description below. So one of the most common cuts I like to make is just the X across. Um, my personal favorite is just cutting along this line. And you can see it doesn't have to be super deep. You want, you want it to go in a little bit and it's okay if it drags a little bit. I find that having the bread sit overnight in the refrigerator really helps to make the cut a lot easier. Some people even pop it in the freezer for 20 or 30 minutes beforehand. Like I said, I'm not super artistic with these cuts. Here's, here's what I do like to do. Uh, a thin little squiggle and then some little lines out and you have yourself some nice leaves. All right, now what we're going to do is pop this back in the Dutch oven. Okay, so I'm gonna set the oven to 475 and this is no preheating, it's considered a cold start. I place the bread in the center of the oven and what's critical for me is that I have a pan beneath. This prevents the bottom from burning because we cook bread so often, I just leave that pan in the oven all the time. So I don't have to remember. I will often forget if I pull it out. All right, now I'm gonna set my timer for 57 minutes. Your oven and time may vary. 60 minutes is really common. When we have multiple loaves, we will bake back to back. So our second one, we can do almost 10 minutes less. I generally set it for 47 minutes to 50 for my second and third loaf. And we don't have to take the top off even, which is really incredible. So uh, we're just gonna set the timer for 57 minutes and come back to a beautiful loaf and we'll throw the next two in. All right, so there you go. That is a nice loaf we've got. A uh, really solid ear. You can see that really pretty bubbling, stretching. Bottom's crisp but not burnt. Now, of course, my design wasn't great. Um, I've not figured that part out, but it still looks nice. It's a really pretty loaf, and I'm really happy with that beauty right there. All right, so we're going to start the next one. I'm going to set this. Um, just on, I'm gonna set this on a surface where it can be aerated from top to bottom, and we'll, we'll go for the next one. Now I'm gonna demonstrate how we cut our bread. Uh, I like this knife a lot, I'll link to it. It's a Mercer knife. All right, now we're gonna talk about flour. The most basic thing you need to know is that you need unbleached flour. Um, these are two great options, King Arthur and the generic Whole Foods brand. Um, there's a lot of different flours out there. The higher the protein, the more gluten structure you're gonna get. However, whole grain flours, I find, tend to make a denser bread. For a long time I did 100 uh, grams of whole grain and then 400 grams of all-purpose. Just not as good as a result if I just do the all-purpose or bread flour. So again, what's important is that it's unbleached. The bleach will kill the starter, so that's why we don't want to use it. There is a company out there, if you're trying to go bulk, um, they make a, some great bread flours. So the loaf that inspired me to start making sourdough was the rosemary sourdough loaf from Whole Foods. And it's phenomenal, it's a delicious loaf. My wife and I kept buying it every time we visited and spending $7 on a loaf of bread started to add up. Um, now we probably spend anywhere between $1.50 to $2 to make this loaf. So 
uh, the pandemic hit and sourdough bread became popular again. So I thought, you know what? I gotta give it another try. And after two years of finally getting what I would say is a perfected loaf, we, uh, we had a request to bring some bread to a dinner party we were going to and didn't have time. So I said, you know what? I'll just go back to Whole Foods. It's on the way and I'll pick up that loaf. Well, uh, looked beautiful, nice crispy crust. But when we cut in the aeration, there was something not quite right. Um, my wife was like, this tastes like bunny bread. It just didn't have that sourdough flavor. And my guess is that they're probably adding some sort of instant yeast or maybe a preservative or two just so that it has a longer shelf life. But the ultimate point I'm trying to make is there's nothing better than homemade bread, fresh out the oven and onto your family's plates. There's such a rewarding, fulfilling uh, feeling that I get whenever I see people enjoy a good loaf of bread. So. I know this is a ton of information I'm throwing at you, but what I want you to walk away from is this approach of experimentation. Asking yourself why, as you start to do this and get different results, come back to this video and see what you might be doing slightly differently. Look at other videos. I'll include some other videos and playlists that I've really loved. But again, this is all experimentation. Every loaf, there's no such thing as a failed loaf. Every loaf is gonna still serve you, even if it only serves your compost pile. It's still a great practice and process. And once you start getting consistent results, it's really fulfilling. I'd love to hear how your loaves turn out. Let me know in the comments below.